Well, okay. Before I get into very concrete recommendations, there's one overarching recommendation that I would make. In fact, uh, I had a very near miss, like an asteroid with the Earth, perhaps, with a very prestigious publisher who very nearly published my book, but then said in the end he couldn't because I didn't have a solution. So I asked him, well, what do you, and, and he put very severe constraints on what a solution should be. It should make everybody happy and it should be <laughs> politically feasible. So I asked him, well, maybe that's like trying to square the circle. What do you think a solution would be? And he said, I don't know. Well, I don't think anybody knows. But in any case, it provoked me to think what, a, what would look like a solution. And my overarching recommendation is a public education campaign make people aware of the race differences. Just make them aware, not with any particular plan of action in mind, just bring the facts to their consciousness. I have the possibly naive faith as a teacher that when people know the facts, rational decisions take care of themselves. That would be my hope. Now obviously the left is tremendously fond of race conscious solutions. Now I here my thinking has somewhat changed over the years. I used to think more race conscious solutions are needed than I now think are needed. I now think, to put it in a nutshell, is that what we need are sensible policies, not necessarily race conscious ones. But because of the misinformation that exists about race, Disparate impact has an absolute veto power on virtually every sensible idea anybody has. So if we can just get the information out, get people to realize that sensible and reasonable things will inevitably have different effects on the races, let's do the sensible things anyway. If there's no reason not to do them except for the disparate impact, that itself would probably go a long way toward diffusing our problems. So once again, I come back to a theme I'll repeat. I see the need for a massive educational and public information campaign to make everyone aware of and used to the race differences in intelligence and temperament. I sort of imagine, ha, fantasy, Clinton addressing a joint session of Congress and the country, a sort of emergency speech on the race issue, in which he simply says, we, I want to speak to you about an extremely unpleasant topic, but it's necessary to consider it. Recent research has shown that would probably do the trick, but um, I don't see it, don't see it happening. But in any case, what needs to be done, maybe it's the one thing we here can do, because I mean, that kind of thing is in the air. What can we, this one-tenth of one percent who seem not to have our heads in the sand, do? Simply try to get the information out in the hope and faith that when people see the facts, their thinking will begin to change. I should just say, um, my own intuition about people is that it's going to be a little easier to do than you might suppose. Given our very small numbers, the media, the, the, the size of the media, the state of extreme denial that everybody seems to be in. What I think is going on, my own intuition, is that everybody knows there are race differences in intelligence and temperament. Everybody knows in their heart of hearts that this is so. What they really need is someone to say it, and someone to say it in a way that makes it legitimate to say. I mean, speaking just personally, I have never said anything that Arthur Jensen or other psychologists haven't said a million times before in technical journals. The only value in a professor saying it is not to convince people, but simply to show them it's okay. Somebody with letters after his name can say this. And when they see that, when they see it's okay to say it, when they see the sky doesn't fall, they'll feel it's okay to say it, they'll feel it's okay to think it, then maybe things will change. So we're not really trying to persuade people of what they don't already know. We're trying to persuade them it's okay to say what they do already know. Try it with people. I don't mean to be digressive. But I've had many conversations that go like this. Someone will say, but it isn't true. Blacks aren't less intelligent than whites. I'll point out some of the evidence and they'll say, but you shouldn't say it. It'll hurt their feelings. 
<laughs> now, no one gets persuaded in 30 seconds. Obviously, they already thought deep down inside that this was so. And they expressed their qualms by denying it, but that's not what they were really thinking. They were really thinking it's true but bad to say. And the thing is just to show them it's not bad to say. But now we get to what seemed to me the, the really big issue, that we can't pursue rational policies because of the racial taboo. And here is again the dialectic. Somebody thinks of a good idea. Everybody realizes, and this is the bad faith and double thing, that this good idea will have a disparate racial impact. Therefore, we can't do it. And some very concrete examples and some concrete proposals. In New York recently, the, uh, the new mayor decided to send the police department to round up truants, because truants rob people during the day. <coughs> Immediately, the cry went up that this was racist, because everybody knew who the truants were. They're going to be blacks and Puerto Ricans, as indeed they were. And everybody said, well, you see the police, they see three black kids together, they're going to stop them. They see three, it's always put this way, rich white kids from the east side. That's also a single word. <laughs> <laughs> they see three white kids from the east side, they're not going to stop them. Which is absolutely true. Because three white kids from the east side who are not in school are very probably doing something that's perfectly OK, going to a sporting event, uh, something like that. So here we have a complete, and this, the truancy policy is under tremendous pressure and may be ended. So here we have a perfectly rational idea, which is not race conscious, but can't be pursued because people know it's going to have a disparate impact. Another example, college athletics. This is not sort of a government thing, but certainly should be talked about. Every once in a while, it becomes recognized that college athletics have become the minor leagues for, the, for professional athletes. And that's really not the way things should be. You should have student athletes who are part of the student body who are better athletes than the other students who represent your college against other colleges. That's the way it used to be. That's great. Not kids who, who score, in effect, chance on SATs and then get basketball scholarships. But every time the NCAA seeks to impose even very minimal standards, like a 700 on the S, combined 700 on the SAT, uh, which you don't exactly have to be uh, a high energy physicist to get, there is an immediate uproar that this is racist. And the black coaches threaten to resign and so on. And they are right in a sense that if indeed some sort of minimal standards for college athletes were imposed, there would be a tremendous drop in the number of blacks on campus. And the only answer to that really is, so what? That that's the way things have to be. Similarly, it seems to me self-evident that there should be ability grouping in schools for all kinds of reasons. There's this, the only argument I've ever heard against it, this truly idiotic argument, that good students profit from being with bad students because by having to explain the material to the bad students, they learn it better. Well, that's, <laughs> this is just not the way things are. But why, so why can't there be ability grouping? There can't be ability grouping because everybody knows what would happen if there was ability grouping. All the, well, not all, but a tremendous disproportion of black students would end up in the track designed for manual labor and manual skills, which are less prestigious, less remunerative. The high ability track would be whites and certainly Asians. Now, this would be good for everybody, really, because who, who innovates in society? Where are the inventions that come from the high track? But you can't do this because everybody knows what would happen. And I think the, and, and people are going to say, well, you know, on one hand, they know it's going to happen. They don't want it to happen. On the other hand, when you say it's going to happen, you're called, let's say, I have here what you're called. You're called a pessimist. You're called a biological determinist. You're called a rationalizer for white hegemony, even though this is what's going to happen. And I think the only thing that we, the, what my, is ne necessary and may well be sufficient is simply to say, 
It's not any of these things. It is a fact. It is the way things are. If you're going to run a rational educational system, then whites and Asians are going to do much better than blacks will. And it just, you just have to get used to that fact. That uh, you know, people worry about the feelings of blacks, and I suppose that is a problem which um, bothers me. But still, it's just something that has to be gotten used to. The feelings of a small subgroup don't count as much as the well-being of all of society and justice for all of society. OK. Uh, Jerry would like me to finish. And so what I would like to see, once again, I began and I'll end it, is a public education <coughs> campaign. Get the facts before the people, and rational decisions will take care of themselves, I hope. <laughs>